President Zelensky, First Lady, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Mr. President, it's been nearly nine months of this war now. Did you expect it to last this long? Do you have any idea of how long it might last? Thank you for the question and thank you for the meeting. You asked whether I thought this war would last so long. No, because I didn't start this war. And I'm sure there isn't a single Ukrainian who knew what this will be and what tragedy this would bring to every home in our country. Because, I'll repeat, we did not start this war, but Ukrainian society united and showed that it was ready for what unfortunately was such a tragedy, showed that it was ready for these challenges. I was really impressed by the power of one nation and was impressed by the swiftness of the response of Europe, the whole world and the whole international community that rallied around Ukraine for this challenge. First Lady, what motivates you to get up in the morning? How do you feel that you've endured this war? Well, thank you. It's a big question. It covers many spheres of my life. And what helps me get up in the morning, um, surely, as you said, it's my husband's example. I know that if he endures, then I have to endure. If the day's begun, then we have to keep fighting. That keeps me going. It's not easy every day, but you know, you need to keep running. You cannot stop. As Alice has said, in order to stay in place, you have to run even faster. That's why we run. And I get some inspiration from the kids, from the children. First and foremost, there are some ordinary things that every family is doing. You need to get your son ready for school. You need to make sure he has had breakfast. Well, unfortunately, I don't have the assurance that my child would go to school every day because of those strikes with missiles and drones. There's a lot of work, a lot of humanitarian projects that we will continue after the war. That helps a lot. Uh, Mr. President, I wanted to ask you how you react. And I know that you all um, monitor Russian casualties and Russian activity uh, on the Ukrainian battlefield. But the Pentagon actually, as a very senior defense official said, and I'm going, to, I'm going to quote to get it right, that Russia has probably lost half of its main battle tanks, used up most of its precision guided weapons in this war, that 80% of their land force is bogged down here, is stuck here in Ukraine. Does that match your figures? And what is your answer to that? I think this more or less corresponds to reality. Although, frankly speaking, nobody knows the full reality, especially as regards personnel. Because nobody can tell you precisely how many people died. Nevertheless, we clearly understand that the artillery that was provided as assistance to us from the United States and Europe, it definitely had to break this initiative which Russia launched us on the 24th of February. And we did break this military initiative. We stopped them. We deoccupied a large part of our territory. And this indeed was helped by the artillery and the new technologies. We never resorted to any of the lies that the Russian Federation produces about dirty bombs or nuclear challenges and so on. And I'm very pleased that we are working jointly and responding quickly to that. Straight after Russia's allegations, we invited the IAEA and they verified everything and said it's just another lie from Russia. So I cannot confirm those numbers for sure, but I can say for sure that it is a stunning number, both in terms of heavy weapons and personnel. Are their losses heavier than your losses? Yes, 10 times. I think so, approximately. I can't give you the exact numbers, but there's a very significant difference because our war tactic is not to throw people because 
people are most important, not to use people as cannon fodder. And that's why it is very important to us whenever we ask our partners for artillery or armored vehicles that it is not just about the weapons, but first of all, protection for our military. Uh, Madam First Lady, you just returned from a major tech conference in Lisbon. And I think the world has noted that Ukraine has used technology in a really innovative and effective way. What was your message there and what do you want the tech world to do for this country? Well, my message was pretty simple, and I hope it was heard. The people gathered there were people who pushed technology forward. These people have an impact on which direction technology and the whole world will move in the future. So my appeal to them was to choose a side what technology they will invent or design. Will this be a technology that kills or a technology that defends? Because we have a wonderful and vivid example. For example, Bellingcat recently conducted their latest investigation and they found a group of IT experts from Russia, young people aged 23, 25. Before the war, they worked in private IT companies and now they're targeting missiles at our buildings. And this is a choice, a conscious choice made by people who know this technology, who have the expertise, are narrow specialists. They chose to be murderers and terrorists. So my appeal to all those thousands of people gathered at the Web Summit was to make their choice from a moral and ethical standpoint as to what they will do in the future. And really, the technologies help. Mr. President, what is the status of Kherson and the impending battle to retake Kherson? <laughs> You know, that's a very serious question. And I'll be frank with you. I'll try to answer it in a way that doesn't give you an answer, to be honest. Because these planned military actions, they are discussed in a small circle, but then they're executed in silence. And I really want to have an unpleasant surprise for the enemy and not something they're prepared for. So I'd like to apologize. But at any rate, our people and your public need to know that we're working on some very serious steps with a positive outcome for the citizens of Ukraine and all those communities that support peace in Ukraine. The Russians are observed as digging in very, very hard, some three to four layers all the way down to the south, to the port, um, to the sea. Do you believe that they're mounting a more serious defense of Kherson than perhaps of the other areas that you've liberated? That's right. They have a very powerful defense. And not only me, but our military headquarters, we met. And at first, we didn't believe that they would be running away from Kherson. I believe that this was just an attempt to draw more Ukrainian troops in that direction. First Lady, we've heard of many Ukrainian children being taken over to Russia. We don't know really what's happening to them. Here in Kiev and in the area, I've met and watched over the last few days kids who've been obviously traumatized by the war, the air raid sirens frighten the little ones, um, kids who've been told to be quiet and hide quietly, uh, have difficulty speaking and communicating. Some kids have seen horrible things happen under occupation, their mothers raped, for instance. Obviously, you're a mother, but you're very involved in the mental health aspect and with your foundation also with women and children. First of all, it's a big tragedy that our children are being taken away to Russia. There's a large number of children who our social services lost connection with, and we can't find them. Sometime in summer, the Russians relaxed their adoption legislation. They simplified the procedure to adopt Ukrainian children, which is horrible, and we understand we'll have to fight for them, and we keep talking about it at all international forums. Currently, we have an agreement on the evacuation of two children's homes from the Odessa region, and there's already an agreement reached with Turkey. We're trying to save them in advance. But just two days ago, I heard the news that a children's home has been moved from the occupied territories in Kherson region. We cannot reach them, unfortunately. We cannot save them. But hopefully, the international community will help us return our children. Now, as regards helping those children who suffered psychologically from the horrors of war, now there's hundreds of these children already. And we can't even imagine what those children suffered. 
who had to bury their own mother in the yards of their homes, who saw their relatives murdered, who stayed in the basements of Mariupol. We can only observe them and try to help. And for that purpose, we are establishing a national program on mental health and psychosocial support, which I hope will have a lot of projects for kids. I can give you an example. Once fairly successfully, I believe, we organized a camp together with Ukrainian psychologists and donors. There were 20 kids with psychological issues. We took them to a special camp where the tutors were psychologists. They spent 20 days in Spain under constant 24-hour psychological monitoring, and this therapy had wonderful results. The children who didn't speak started speaking. The children who had eating disorders, who didn't eat at all, and there was a boy who never slept. The tutors had to sleep beside him because he could only sleep if there was somebody next to him. And indeed, we saw wonderful results. We want to scale up this project. We are supported by experts from Israel and Belgium. The next training destination for our specialists will be the UK. Very soon, this month, we will be sending our psychologists and psychotherapists for training there. We choose the world's best practices for coping with PTSD, 